Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, the greatest live broadcast in all of YouTube. I'm glad you're along with us uh, for episode six of the real season 11 here. Um, what we do here on Getting Sketchy, if you're new to this, is uh, either myself or Ashley, we try to create a drawing for you inside of 45 minutes. We also try to sprinkle in a little bit of entertainment and education along the way. And of course, this is broadcast live. So um, there's, there's some pretty high stakes going on here. We, we can make mistakes. Uh, yes. Equipment fails. All kinds of crazy things happen here. Uh, but like I said, I'm always joined by Ashley and he's sitting right over there. How are you doing, Ashley? I'm doing great, Matt. Thank you for asking. I hope you folks are doing well also. I'm sorry that I missed you last week. We had some a little bit of sickness in my house, so I couldn't be here. We took the week off, but um, you're here, we're here, and everything is returning to normal. So it's a good Wednesday. Absolutely, and uh, we're going to get into the drawing in just a minute. But I'd like to remind you, if you are watching this live on YouTube, there's a chat box, of course. You can post comments and questions during tonight's broadcast. If you do have a comment or question that's directed specifically at Ashley or I, we're asking you to use the Super Chat function. It does cost a little bit of money, but it definitely helps our channel out and helps this broadcast out. So we would really appreciate it if you did that. That will highlight your comment or question and make sure that it gets addressed amongst all the other comments and questions. Uh, but of course, you're welcome to comment and, and post as much as you want. And if you sure. haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click on the notification bell. And there might be something else you have to click on to make sure that you're notified when our videos go live here, when we go live with uh, the broadcast. Uh, but that'll also get you subscribed so that you can get access to all of our other videos or get notified <laughs> when I post new videos uh, like I do on a regular basis. Um, also, if you like this video, make sure you give it a like. And uh, if you're watching the recorded version of this, of course, post a comment below this video. That, that's helpful as well. And uh, tell us what you think. Also, if you haven't already, check out the membership program over at thevirtualinstructor.com. It includes uh, a ton of drawing and painting courses on a variety of subject matter and media, weekly live lessons. So after we're done here with Getting Sketchy, I'm gonna be continuing with the live lesson series that I'm doing for members. Those live lesson series are longer, uh, more finished, more developed pieces of artwork. And of course, we bring you along the ride with us. And all the live lessons are recorded and stored in our vault. There's also weekly critiques as part of the Members Minute and a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers, which includes everything you really need to teach for an entire year. Um, all of that is included with the membership program. If you want to check out the membership program, there's a link in the description below. You can go check it out. There's also a link in the description below if you want to check out three of our course videos and eBooks for free as well. And that will put you on our newsletter list. A lot of people ask how to get on the newsletter list. Uh, that's the way you do it. There's a link in the description below and that will put you on our newsletter list so I can send you emails about new videos and lessons, of course. Um, so uh, there's comments on here about the weather. Seems like there's lots of wind There's everywhere. There's a lot of weather happening right now. Yeah, lot, lots of lots of weather. And mm. yes, it a, a storm did come through here um, just a little while ago, and it was pretty it's pretty normal storm for this area. Uh, we we get tornadoes and stuff uh, around here. Uh, Occasionally, we somebody do. somebody said there might have been a tornado around here, but we're we're okay. This, the weather's gone, so uh, the the connection seems just fine. So uh, we should be good and to hopefully go. Hopefully. It's good where you guys are at too. Where, where yeah, absolutely. Yep. All right. Um, I think I've done enough procrastinating. I'm procrastinating a little bit <laughs> because, like always, I'm, I'm a little apprehensive about getting this one done in 45 minutes. But we'll see. So let's go ahead and switch over, and we'll get into All it. All right. Let's do it. Well, I switched over because I hit the wrong button. <laughs> I was supposed to hit the transition button and I uh, hit the wrong button and it started the timer and everything. Boy, I always do something. I always break something here live. Yeah, it's, we're gonna it make seems a checklist. Like there's always something I do. Oh, and before we get started, I get to procrastinate some more because Jan has given us a super chat. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Everyone is or everybody is healthy. Looking forward to today's lesson. Yes, I'm looking forward to today's lesson too. And uh, at least in my house, 
we're more healthy than we were last week. So we've still got a we've got a recovering child on antibiotics, but everything's looking everything's looking up. Trending in the right direction. Thank you, Jan, for Jan, asking. we really appreciate that. Um, and we are definitely glad to be back as well. After missing last week, those things happen, of course. Mm -hmm. um, the photo reference that I'm going to be working from is right up here on your screen. But if you want to uh, have the photo reference for yourself, you can find it on, at the community tab on the YouTube channel. So you're watching this video, uh, but you might not be on the YouTube channel. So uh, if you look at the little icon on my face underneath this video, clicking on it will take you to the YouTube channel. Just look for the community tab there, and then you will have... Uh, the reference there so you can create your all drawing and Jen says breaking things is part of your charm Matt <laughs> thanks you've been really charming lately. I think yeah I, yeah the last few broadcasts I have just broken something every broadcast mm -hmm. I still I don't know if I mentioned this on getting sketchy or the live lessons but on my my equipment here I have buttons I have to push to change camera angles and all that stuff and for the longest time I had visual depictions of what each camera was and now I updated things and the pictures aren't there anymore so i have to read the words and i keep pushing the wrong buttons and i i know i, I can change them back to pictures but i haven't done that but oh well uh well i'll continue to push the wrong button so mm -hmm. we'll you just can, keep going you'll memorize that. them just yeah. in time to change them. well i haven't memorized them yet it's been weeks so uh <laughs> i don't think that's going to happen i think I, I need to go back to the button or, or the images of the buttons or, or make the buttons bigger yeah i can't do that mm, i can't make the buttons bigger the whole console yeah <laughs> <That'd be laughs> i'll contact the people that make this and say can you make one with bigger buttons <laughs> Like uh, those huge calculators, remember, right. buttons for like two square inches. Right, or at least allow me to zoom in to make the button was bigger. Anyway, um, all right, so the paper we're going to be working on, this is pastel matte paper, and I'm using uh, the darker gray surface here. And actually, this paper was sent to me by a very special friend, and you know who you are out there. And I just want you to know that I am using the paper that you sent me. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for that. Uh, a fan of the virtual instructor. Um, and I'm going to be using pastel pencils mostly. So I have my Carbothello pastel pencils there, and I've already pulled out a few colors here. Um, this, the Carbothello pencils here, let me get rid of this junk that was transferred there. Um, the Carbothello pencils do, do not have a color listed on them. They just have a number. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to name the color. Uh, I'm going to name the color based on color theory. So uh, this would be like a primary yellow, for example. Um, this color would probably be close to a cerulean, like a light cerulean. Mm. So that's, that's kind of how we're going to do things here, even though cerulean has nothing to do with color it's theory. A it's a pigment. It's, uh, it's definitely blue, and it, it, would, it leans toward green. It's true. You call it that. Um, Blue that leans toward green. Let's see. I also have way back behind me some of my Rembrandt pastels. Um, we're going to use that for the background mostly. Okay. And maybe to touch up some of the parts of the bird if we need some stronger highlights. Well, and it's things. a fantastic reference. Did you modify this reference any? I did. Okay. Yeah, I cropped it a little bit differently um, and enhanced contrast and color a little bit. But uh, that's about it. Um, let's see, what else do I have? Uh, I have some paper towels. I have one dry paper towel that I will use mostly to protect the artwork from the uh, vicious effects of the palm of my hand. Mm -hmm. And I have a moistened paper towel here. Um, this is all the sweat I wiped off my forehead before we went live. <laughs> no. Um, this is just a little bit of water on here. And if I do any blending or smudging or get pastel material on my fingers, I'll just kind of do this and get the pastel material off. So I, I've gotten to the habit of having a moist paper towel handy when I work with pastels. All right. So uh, my plan here is to sketch out the basic shapes and contours of the bird with a lightly colored pastel uh, pencil. Probably gonna start with this light gray here. And uh, then from there, I'm gonna block in the major shapes of color that I see. There's a blue shape, there's a orange, I mean, a, a yellow shape, and there's kind of a darker red shape. And um, that's the plan, anyway. All right. All right. Let's start the timer then, I guess. 
you start and the timer, we'll, and then we'll we've had a it. couple questions, so we'll get into those after you get started. Okay. I'm going to hit the timer. Boom. 45 minutes. Oh, uh, the size of the paper here, I, I did, forgot to say that. Um, this is five inches by six and a half inches, so it's almost proportional to the reference. Okay. It's close enough. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out where the top of the head is going to be. And then the bottom of the tail is going to go off somewhere right in this location. And the beak is going to end somewhere close to here. It's Wait just a, a little bit lower than the top of the head. Yeah, it's because it curves yeah. up just a touch, doesn't it? All right, so now that I've got kind of those areas figured out, I'm going to start by now you get some targets in, target thing. Right. Now it's just target practice. It helps mm -hmm. folks when your picture plane is proportional to your reference. If you happen to be working from a, from a photograph, you may as well take advantage of, of uh, the proportions of the photograph. And you can measure or guesstimate how far the elements of your subject are from the edges of the picture plane. That's how Matt was analyzing this composition to give himself those targets. Now, if you're working from life without a reference photo, um, you can still do the same kind of thing with a viewfinder. So I used to keep two L-shaped pieces of mat board in my drawing box. And that way, if I were drawing or sketching outside, I could kind of fit those L shapes together to match the proportions of my sketchbook or whatever I was drawing on and hold it up in front of me. Then I was still looking through a rectangle and it, it gave me just more, more information to make those comparisons and measurements. So you can do that. Whether you, even when even if you're working without a photograph, of course the branch needs to be included there. So again, using comparisons between the sod and the edges of the picture plane, get a pretty good idea of where the branch is going to be. Now I'm not worried about the edges or anything because we're going to clean those up with mm -hmm. uh, the pastels at the end. So, so we had a question um, right before you you started drawing uh, from Orion Nebula. How do you, and she says she knows you've answered this before, or probably have, and I think we've talked about it before. How do you sharpen those with a razor or a sandpaper, or perhaps both? Uh, yeah, I do it both ways. Like this pencil here, I cut with a, uh, a hobby, blade. Hobby knife, exacto knife. And then I can use my sandpaper here to sharpen it. If you try to get the point too sharp with the, with the razor blade, I think that's where you're running the risk of chipping it a little bit. So that's probably a good idea to sharpen the wood away and leave yourself a fair amount of filament, you know, kind of blocky and chunky coming out of the, uh, the wooden sheath, and then, and then file it down to a point using the sandpaper. So I think that's, especially if, you're, if your pastel pencils are pretty soft. And they're usually harder than the soft pastel sticks so that they might hold up a little bit better under sharpening, but they're still, it's still a soft medium. I also wanted to show you this pencil here that I'm continuing to hold my hand um, because I used a uh, pencil sharpener oh, yeah. to sharpen that. So I, I do both. I go, I go both ways. It's just whatever is... Within reach? Within reach. <laughs> whatever is convenient. All right, so I was a little bit worried about this. Um, this... This branch needs to go up a little bit higher. One thing um, I like about the composition is uh, the bird, the gesture of the bird is in one di diagonal and then the branch is in a, another diagonal. It's a little flatter, but diagonal nonetheless. And so we have this nice sort of X. And they intersect in a third too. Mm -hmm. right? Oh yeah, that's right. Very good. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna just kind of figure out where the little sections are. Uh, this pastel matte paper it does dull the pencil very quickly uh, because it it has deceptive deceptive tooth. It's deceptively strong mm -hmm. tooth. Um, so I'm not really worried about the pencil getting dull, but but something to point out there. So this is my blue section, yellow section, red section. And let's see, I feel like this needs to come down a little bit further. We're going to make that yellow section a little bit larger. 
Our eye is going to be right in this area, and we're going to bring up the top of the head a little bit higher. Just making little adjustments there. And you'll just work right over top of your drawing with your colors. Yes. You won't try to lift any of that extra pass. No, there. not at all. Okay. I'm, I'm just trying to get an idea lift off of that paper anyway of where things are. Um, earlier, before we uh, before you started drawing, Matt, there was a question from Buddy, and she says, "I'm trying to finish a getting sketchy sketch with colored pencils within the time limit." LOL. Yeah. Good luck. Should yeah. Good good luck to us too. Should switch to pastel. Um, if you want to if you want to get it done in the time limit, you could always switch to pastel as a as a solution because pastel does cover space much faster and. Uh, you know, you don't have to necessarily work by building up as many layers. It, is Buddy saying she's doing this one tonight? No, I, don't think, I don't. I didn't with colored that pencils because that is gonna. That's that's just gonna frustrate yeah, you. Yeah, I don't and, know if it was this one. So uh, I was gonna go on go on and say that um, pastels and colored pencils are super different, even though the pastel pencils come in a pencil form, and you know that because you use both. So some some subject matter lend themselves more to pastel or colored pencil. So uh, if I misunderstood the question and you're specifically talking about this piece, um, then it, it might be a bit of a st struggle to do with colored pencils inside the time limit for sure. All right, I'll start getting some color on here. I love the, start with this blue. the way the shadows lay across the bird in places. It's got strong highlights, but there's some just some little, little cast shadows, it looks like, across the front of the bird. So what I'm going to do now is just fill in these shapes of color with one base color. Mm -hmm. and just get those nice and covered. And then I can adjust the values and the colors that exist in each section. Oh, it was a it was a buddy was specifically talking about of the flower you did in pastel about four months ago. So in one of the previous seasons, it may have been the one with the purple stolens. I don't know if I'm using the right word. And that was, was it a Georgie O'Keefe? If it was, that was a pastel. So I don't know if you could do that in 45 minutes. Yeah, that would with probably a, be a little bit pencil. difficult. Yeah. yeah. All right, looks like we got super another chat. super chat, so we'll give you a cheer USF for that. Girl 07 says, I have a question. I hope we'll have an answer. Yeah, I yeah. wonder if that's University of South Florida. A, uh, a uh, rival to my Charlotte 49ers. Uh, let's... Uh, Go to the next section here. I'm just going to start with kind of a lighter yellow. And some of the yellows up there are darker and some are lighter than this. This is somewhere in the middle. Just laying in some base colors. Now, and USF girls, a yellow step, back here. I haven't seen your question, but I'm watching for it. So, pops up, we'll take it. There's a little bit of yellow up here, too, so we'll go ahead and throw a little bit of that down. And let's go to our... Yeah, there's a little bit of red darker red, bird too, isn't there? There's a lot There's a lot yeah, of red on the back. I didn't notice that so. at first glance. You've really got a primary primary bird up there. Yeah, and this is, this is my initial red here for this section. This is not red. It's kind of an earthier, earthier red. It's kind of more like a terracotta color. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, this will serve as a pretty good base color for this area. And I'm trying to get as much information down as quickly as possible so we can have as much time as possible to refine the drawing. There is a little bit of this color right here, believe it or not. And there's a little bit of that right over the eye here too. And then up on the top, we have a little bit more of a red orange. Mm -hmm. 
do you know if the pastel matte comes in variable grits or is it is it sort of one i have not seen variable grits it doesn't no doesn't maybe if it doesn't define like what the grid is i guess on the cover or then i guess there's maybe there's not i would look at my pad but i would have to stop and turn around don't do that and Keep look going. at oh i'm not it's doing that I'm, I'm not doing that <laughs> uh so i'm using a dark gray here for the dark areas initially we'll go darker but for right now just a little bit of dark gray down here again just kind of like a base color Mark says that he has seen different grit values, like there's a 300 and a 400, and that may not correspond to actual sandpaper grit, because, boy, 300 seems pretty rough um, to draw on, but, uh, but it may. So, so, there are, so there's some options there. That's good to know. Thank you, Mark. Okay, back around the eye here, right over the top of the eye, again with the gray. Uh, by the way, Matt, USF Girl 07 is, in fact, an alum of the University of South Florida. There you go. Colombo Matt. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and take this gray right along the edge here. There's a little bit of a little bit of a darker value underneath there. Around his collar. And then we'll just go ahead and start going up into the breast here. Again, keeping things pretty loose here. And quick, trying to get as much information down as quickly as possible. USF girl, I see your comment. Please read my question. Please restate your question. Sorry to have to ask you to do that. Computer mouse is out of reach. Oh, and it's grow off. Possibly. We, we've got a lot of shadow down here on the mm -hmm. bottom part of the bird here. Already starting to create a sense of light now, dropping those grays in. Now there's a little bit of that greenish color in here, green, blue, green. So go ahead and drop a little bit of that in here too. And we're going to go ahead and get some of that branch color in there, too. I don't think I got that color out, but <laughs> in my hastened planning here, not, not very, very good planning. Um, let's see here. Luckily, I have a pastel handy. Let's go ahead and get some color for the branch. And it is a branch that kind of wraps around itself. It's actually kind of bizarre. It looks like a vine. Twisted yeah, it's vines. a vine. A lot of those in the woods below my house. And right now we're working on a zombie bird. <laughs> that, um, with the white eye. Reminds me of Snow Dog before you put the totally, eye in there. Totally a zombie. Scary. Uh, all right, let's start up here at the beak. Uh, this is kind of a dark bluish purple. And we're going to add some color here. Well, I'm making the value a little bit darker. And I'm actually going to pull a little bit more purple out than that. Make it a little bit more colorful. And then right along the top, we'll go with a lighter value here. This is not white. 
And then right along where that beat connects. All right, we, we have our question from USF Girl 07, and it's a good one. She says, I have successfully covered acrylic paintings on canvas with gesso and then painted over the canvas. Is there an equivalent process for covering oil paint on canvas? Thank you. Well, you're right in not using gesso to cover an oil painting to reuse that canvas because um, gesso is an acrylic-based product, and it's, uh, it's totally okay to paint with oil paint over top of something that's acrylic-based, but not the other way around. So you would have to actually paint over it with white oil paint, a white oil-based paint of some sort. And, um, you know, oil paintings used to be primed with 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 oil paint but over rabbit skin glue so i'm not really i can't remember i've done that before it's but it's been a couple of decades i can't remember if i used um like a thinned out version of white oil paint when i when i primed the surface with oil over rabbit skin glue but uh but you're gonna have to you're gonna have to just use white oil paint and a gesso is white acrylic paint it's just a real thick super thick heavy bodied and and relatively inexpensive version of white acrylic paint. In fact, I've used gesso as white acrylic paint to mix with other colors when I was out of white acrylic paint. So um, it's a little bit of a pain to do that with an oil painting because the, you paint over it and then you have to wait a few days uh, before you can start using that, that newly refreshed canvas. But that's what you need to do is use white oil paint to cover your painting so that your surface is ready for a new composition. Matt, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's a good answer. And I'll go ahead and tell you, I almost never do that. Um, if I've, if I've, in the past, if I've abandoned an oil painting, I just don't, I don't reuse that canvas. But I have done it plenty of times, and especially in the classroom, with unfinished um, acrylic paintings, just to be able to reuse those canvases before. So, you know, acrylic shrinks a little bit when it dries, and so brush strokes aren't as quite as apparent, but oil paint doesn't. A lot of times, if there's distinct brush strokes that you're trying to prime over, or cover, um, you can still see those marks through, you know, through that, through that coverage. So if you're going to cover up an oil painting and it was paint very, you painted very thinly or wherever, whomever had done the painting had painted very thinly and you can still see the weave of the canvas and it may be a candidate, um, to refurbish, but otherwise, um, I'd be careful with, you know, leaving brush strokes in there that might, um, clash with the new subject and the direction of the brush strokes you need for your new subject on that same older canvas. Great question. Okay, so you can see I'm adding bits of black here, starting to get the values a little bit darker. And then we're going to go back over with some stronger color too. So, and some lighter values. I'm trying to carve out that eye up here too. It's really dark right here. And let's go back with. But he says, Matt, the brown. blue feathers already look fantastic, very three dimensional. And I was thinking the same thing, oh, yeah, you know, that gray and the little bit of green that you put down there already already gave it a real, real fluffy kind of poofy feel. Oh, you guys are. It translates you, um, well, just like it does in the reference. Oh, shucks, you guys are <laughs> something else. Uh, let's go ahead and use a little bit of white up here and get this a little bit lighter. Are you going to use, in the background, are you going to use the what we see in the reference? It's kind of a blackish green. I'm going to make it a very dark green, yeah. Okay. That, well, that's the plan. I haven't looked at the, the time yet. You haven't even made it to the halfway point. Uh, you're close. That's not fast enough. <laughs> and while we're here, let's go ahead and make this a little bit lighter up here. Again, just 
putting down shapes of color first and now adjusting the values and also adding some little bits of other colors in there too. And I'm working my way from the top to the bottom okay, just to kind of keep my drawing as clean as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go with a darker yellow in here now. This would be the primary yellow. Remember that guy we talked about earlier? Mm -hmm. First pencil. <laughs> and I haven't, I haven't talked about any of the colors that I'm adding in there, according <laughs> to color theory. <laughs> Got way off base again. All right, so uh, let's well, add... You kind of described your terracotta red. You know, I, that's, dull... as, that's as far as it went. <laughs> um, all right, it's so... It's a dull, dark red, I'll call it that. When we have yellow, and we want to make yellow a little bit darker, uh, a little bit of a trick is to not use black, uh, but instead use brown. Because brown's it... warmer than black. Yes. It change the... Your black so... will make your yellow look green sometimes, folks. Yeah. So that's a good tip. So we'll add a little bit of brown down here. And let's just go a little bit in the corner. And remember, these little edges are going to be cleaned up when we do the background. So don't so worry Matt, about those right now. I know what kind of bird you're painting now. You know, our, yeah, it's, our, a, it's a colorful one. Our folks in the chat are always more knowledgeable when it comes to wildlife than you and myself. Everybody's more knowledgeable. <laughs> I asked Matt when I came it comes over to wildlife. if this was a kingfisher. Because of about the size and the shape and the beak. And it's not. Um, that was my I best told guess. you it wasn't. I got that right. Yeah, that was my best guess. I had to look it up online. It's a bee eater. That's right. That's I think funny I remember because that. for the live lesson that Matt's working on, I, he's oh, drawing bees. That's hilarious. He's drawing bees yes. and their predator all in the same night. A bee eater. That's yeah. uh, so well, if I you mean, want to see the other half of this complimentary pair, hey, re remind me and I'll show you the, the yeah, show you the bee in progress that. in a minute you here. Do that. You bring the bee out tonight. For um, our our folks at here. the end. Don't let me forget. Okay, I'm going to write it in big letters on my note paper. A little bit of a darker blue here, just getting a little bit more variety as we work down the breast here, and this you know this color is not necessarily very prominent in this image, but I'm just trying to get a little bit more variety. Yeah. You know what they say about variety? Do spice you know? of life. It's a spice of life. And it's the spice of bee eaters. <laughs> That's what they say. Let's go with a little bit of white here. Just to make the values a little bit lighter. Now, normally, if I, if I wasn't timed here, I'd probably pick a lighter value of blue before I started with the the white here. But the white is mixing with the color that I already have in place. And it's allowing me to get a little bit of that feeling of feather texture. And as we work down, go back in very, very lightly with a little bit of black here and there. I'm barely the black. <laughs> barely touching it here. I mean, yeah, I've had the black out for a yeah. little while. Um, just barely touching it, though, because I don't want this to get too dark. Let's go ahead and darken up this edge here so we can cut a few pieces in there. And this gets pretty dark up here, too. Buddy, I see your question. I see your comment about uh, about my, our chats, and thank you for that. I oh, appreciate that. Matt and I love talking to each other. We do it whether you guys are here or not. So I'm glad you guys are here uh, to share along in our conversation. If you want to listen for hours, though, you'll have to slow down your player to 0.5 speed, then because this is just an hour program. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I want a little bit of orange up here. Did I want that? I don't know. I just feel like this this red just felt a little unnatural. What is that? A little bit of a... It's like a red-orange. Red orange, sort yeah, of? It's like a red-orange. Okay. 
See, we're using those color wheel terms now. It it needs to be a red orange, but I I want it to be a little stronger. I guess that's pretty that's pretty freaking strong in it. Yeah. Uh, well, it certainly <laughs> will be once you put super black greens behind I it. I want it to be stronger. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see, James. Yes, Matt's working with pastel pencils tonight. You got it, pastel pencils. Oh yeah. Now we're looking like a an animal that eats bees. <laughs> I gotta sharpen this pencil here. You've got time. I, I don't feel like I do. <laughs> Never I feel do. like I've got a lot more now Matt told me that because you know the first several seasons, um he did these episodes alone and uh, then brought me in later on. Probably, what do you think, season five or six, something like that? Yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Mm -hmm. And he told me the early episodes were just 30 minutes. And I, I've seen some of them, but you yeah. know, they're older. I, I just see them scroll across my YouTube. And uh, 30 minutes, can you believe that? That's back and when I was really crazy. <laughs> right. Now we complain about the 45, so. Now I'm, I'm more sane, but not by much. 50% more sane. All right. I'm going to a white pastel stick here. I'm going to try to make a very precision touch here for a highlight. Boy, that, that wasn't precision at all, at all but <laughs> it kind of translates it just fine. Yeah, it looks yeah, good on the it, feet. It looks fine on the paper. Good. I, I missed the eye. <laughs> it's like a highlight on the eyebrow. Let's, right, let's clean right. that up. Let's try it again. All right, this time I'm going to use the edge of the pastel. I have to get my head down real low to the paper to see where it's actually That's touching the idea. page when I do that with a pastel stick. Boom. Nailed it. Got it. That was not easy. Mm -mm. All right, let's go back underneath here and start making some he of these values. the largest work. tool to make the smallest mark. Because <laughs> that's what makes sense, right? Yeah. That's how we do it. All right, and I've got, I've got to have time to do the background here, so I... Again, I'm very concerned. I'm still very concerned. Matt, what was the brand of your pencils again? Uh, these are Carbothello pencils. Okay, Carbothellos. So that's for you, James. But if you've got Conte Apri, those will work really well. Great. Yeah, pencils. They, I have Conte Apri here beside me too. The thing about the Conte Apri is that they are so soft. They're, they're really the best. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're so soft that you have to sharpen them like every 30 seconds, especially when you're working on this paper. Um, and for, for what we're doing here in this broadcast, that's just not, that's not going to happen. All right. So this area right here overall needs to be a little, a little bit darker so that we don't lose the three-dimensional quality of the bird here. Make sure it still translates as three dimensional, but this needs to get darker. But I don't want to lose the color. Now, brazen hearted, I see your question going back to the um, to using gesso. I had mentioned that it's acrylic base, and uh, I've, I've you you mentioned what's the difference for watercolor gesso, and I'm not familiar with watercolor gesso. You know, the gesso is typically um acrylic so that it covers the porous surface of the canvas so that your paint doesn't actually soak down into the canvas especially oil paint and eventually start to rot that rot the the weave of the canvas watercolor on the other hand needs a porous surface to adhere to it needs some paper to soak into so watercolor paper has size in it which is just a fancy word for glue and that little bit of glue that is in watercolor paper that's not in, like, for say, sketch or drawing paper um, helps the watercolor marks to stay nice and crisp and not to bleed out and follow the fibers of the paper. Um, so, but as far as the gesso product goes for use with watercolor, I've never used one. All right, so let's go back over the top of this with that. 
terracotta color again. And make sure we don't lose the color, but we have darker value. So this is what I kind of like to do with the pastel pencils is instead of blending and smudging, just keep going back and forth over the top of the area that you want to make darker mm -hmm. with a darker value and then go back with the color that you want. Just kind of stack them until you get to the mixture you're looking yeah, for. Yeah, you just go back and forth, back and forth. Well, the bird's really starting to, to pop off of the that flat gray background now. I'm sure it'll look great against the dark, Thanks. even darker background when it when it shows up. I hope so. I really uh, hope uh, so. Some, some comments from Shadow Rage about a perfect drawing. Is there such thing as a perfect drawing? And that's philosophical. Um, we do have some theories that we use to guide us in art making, like color theory and compositional theory, uh, but there's still a subjective nature to liking and appreciating art. So, you know, a perfect drawing to you may not be as perfect as somebody else, unless you have an objective standard to judge it by and your, and your criteria is, and for, I'm going to give you an example. I'm drawing this photograph and it looks just like the photograph. If your goal is to make it just like the photograph, then, then you could, you could judge that artwork as being perfect or imperfect. Um, but when we look at artwork, even by photo realists like Chuck Close, um, usually we don't see the photo reference there. Now I've seen a lot of Chuck Close's photo references just because of documentaries and just seeing him work in the studio. You may have too. Uh, but we typically don't judge artwork against its references. And I, it's like I tell my own students, um, whom I never hardly ever give 100s to. So if any of my students are listening right now, she keeps shooting for 100. You're not going to make it. And a top grade in my class is usually a 99. It's like 100 because there's always something maybe we're, me, neither I or my own student are thinking of it at the moment. There's probably always a way to make our artwork even better. And that's what pushes us. So I don't really talk about perfection, um, we sh we, although it is something that we should always strive for. And, and if you know your own criteria, your drawing can be perfect according to your goals, whatever, whatever those might be for a specific piece. So good question. A little bit, little bit philosophical in nature. I don't know. I would say my answer could be judged um, subjectively as well. All my pencils are dull. They're all dull, and I don't Run have time. I don't have time to stop and sharpen them. <laughs> I don't. I just don't have time for that. Well, Barb says it's hard to believe how much you you're getting done in such a short period of time, but you still have almost twelve minutes. That's not enough time. <laughs> I try to say it in a positive way. Yeah. That's not enough time, but I'll do what I can in the time I've been given. So we'll get as much information on here and then I'll cheat and then I'll go over the time limit. That's, that's what I mean by cheating. But let's see how much we can get done here. Lisa, I see your comment about the watercolor ground. So um, thank you for that explanation. We need to have a little bit of detail on the talons here. You know, it's funny you mentioned painting with watercolor on wood or on canvas, and I've never done either of those, but I have used watercolor on ceramics and it can do really great on bisque fire ceramics. So then um, you don't need to add any special product to use it in that on bisque, bisque fire ceramics because ceramic is already porous if it hasn't been glazed. Get some nice effects that way. All right, this, this, this bird's looking pretty good, man. It's looking so good. James is wondering about how you're going to preserve it. Do you use a fixative? I do not use fixatives. Um, and Ashley does. So you'll get two different opinions here. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like to use a fixative anymore. I used to, but it does make the values in the drawing a little bit darker. It and does. sometimes that's an advantage. Sometimes if you create a light drawing and you want it a little darker, a little spray fixative will, will do that for you. Um, but 
you also run the risk of the fixative splattering, which has happened on more than one occasion. And especially if you're not using it regularly, you know, it's right. to dry up in the nozzle a little bit. So if you have fixative and you use it and it's been a little while, of course, it's always a great idea just to spray it across another surface, maybe a dark piece of paper so you can see if there's speckles coming out instead of a fine, fine um, vapory mist. Now, so what Matt said is true. It will make your artwork look a little bit darker. So I use fixative, but I would say I use it in an extremely sparing way. Probably not even enough to really keep the pastel from smearing, just enough to keep it from smearing quite as easily. So I hold my can of fixative about 18 inches to 24 inches, probably two feet away from my artwork laying on the ground on a not windy day. Otherwise, it never makes it to the artwork. It blows away before it gets down there. And I spray the fixative. Um, I start my spray away from the artwork, not over the artwork, because that's when you're most likely to have blobs or speckles come out is when you're, you're uh, actually depressing the nozzle. So I started, you know, away from the artwork and then bring it across quickly in slightly overlapping rows. And, um, and then I will usually wait, a, I mean, very quickly. It's just, just, just a tiny bit of mist on there. Then I give it about a minute, make sure it doesn't look like it got significantly darker in any way. If it did, I stop. Um, and then I usually go in the other direction very quickly again, just a little bit of fixative. So I don't really use a f um, final fixative. I just use workable fixative, which is even less strong. So I don't even know if the amount of fixative that I put on my artwork uh, makes a difference. But I like to think in the subtle shuffling of papers in uh, in drawers from opening and closing, you know, if pastels slide up against each other just a little bit, then that little bit of fixative will be enough to keep them from smearing. But the main way to protect your pastels um, is to frame them with a mat behind glass. And then the mat provides uh, a barrier or I guess like a cushion. A it maintains the space between the piece of paper with the pastel on it and the, and the piece of glass. So that way your pastel is not really touching anything. It's not touching the back of the glass. You don't want that. So put a mat around it or even a double mat. That's even better. You can get spacers that hold the, even hold the mats back further from the glass and then, uh, and then frame it behind glass and it's, it's well protected. Same, same goes for charcoal. Great question. Okay. So as you can probably see, I am making up the branch. There's too many details there for me to try to replicate the branch, especially in the amount of time that, or the vine, whatever it is, in the amount of time that I have. So instead, I'm making something that looks like a, like a branch. Okay. That's yeah. a good solution. Yeah. Just so I can... Creative solution, Matt's responding to yeah. his drawing and, and the clock? Mostly to the clock. <laughs> Mary Elizabeth asks, Ashley, how do you preserve your watercolor on ceramics or can you? Well, now the ceramics that I'm talking about are ceramic sculptures, um, not vessels, not pottery, nothing you would actually use um, like a coffee cup or a plate or anything like that. Because you can't put, I don't know if you could, maybe you could put um, clear glaze and then try to do a glaze firing, but I'll bet the heat would just burn that watercolor pigment away. Um, so, um, so it just kind of soaks in and rests there and then you can spray it with crystal clear, you know, crystal clear is another, I think that's an acrylic based, um, product. Also, it's a clear, kind of like clear varnish a little bit. And, uh, so you can spray it with crystal clear and that'll, uh, you know, just provide another, um, another level of protection, but doesn't really wipe off the ceramics very easily because it actually soaks into the those, those fine little pits and pores in the bisque bisque ware. All right, here we go. I'm gonna put in some black and some green. All right, and uh, see if we can't so make Matt's this got a nice. Lot of primary colors in this bird, mm -hmm. and then he's using some green in the background. And we know we all know that green is a secondary color, but it's so important. You know, it's the main color, one of the main colors of our earth. So I like to call green uh, the fourth primary, just because it seems so important. 
even though it is a secondary in fact. So let's see a little bit of green in there. All right, let's have a green shape right here, which is in the reference. And then there's another one down here. And a little bit of one over here. A little one down here. And I'm going to put another one over here. And if we don't like it, we can cover it up. And then let's go with the black. There we go. Mark, I see your suggestion about um, to create sort of that watercolor effect with ceramics, but be able to glaze it afterward as a water down under glazes. I'll bet you can. That's a great idea. It probably costs a little more. The under glazes are more expensive sometimes than cheaper watercolors that I've used with ceramics before, but uh, that's a great idea. Might try that. Keith asks, while we were talking about surfaces, do you know if you need to stretch watercolor paper for gouache? Sorry, can't get the super chat to work, maybe because I'm on, on an iPad. Maybe so, but I'm going to take your question anyway, um, and, uh, and thank you for your question. So I don't think so. You know, with gouache, you're not using large amounts of water or saturating the paper to create smooth, even washes like you might would need to do, say, for a clear open sky in a watercolor landscape. So I don't stretch watercolor paper for gouache paintings. And then I also like to use pretty as heavy a paper as I have available for any painting that is watercolor or gouache. You know, if I can get my hands on 300 pound paper, that's great. Sometimes, you know, I want a smoother surface like hot press, I'll use 140 pound. And usually my gouache paintings aren't crazy big either. So maybe if there was a larger piece of paper, I might experience a little bit, a little bit more um, buckling. Um, but I try to, I try to use only as much water as I have to with gouache. So I don't think you need to be as concerned about stretching your paper. Can't hurt. If you love stretching watercolor paper, it can't hurt. Now I've seen watercolor paper. I saw a portrait that was done in the 1950s in somebody's house. It was like a personal possession that had been in their family. And it was a beautiful watercolor portrait stretched around stretcher bars, just like a canvas. And it was in the, along the edges, the paper had even been nailed in with brass tacks, just like we used to do with canvas before staple, book, staple guns became all the rage in, can, in stretching canvas. So it's so puzzling. I've always wanted to try that, to actually get a nice heav heavyish piece of watercolor paper and soak it a little bit and actually stretch it around stretcher bars and see what that's like to paint on. A little bit of a bouncier surface. Okay, so hopefully, I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna get this all filled in in a minute 46, but I'm gonna try. All right. And then we'll clean up the edges. We're gonna have to go back over the top of some of these areas. Okay. A little bit. Matt, we got a super chat all from right. the numbers girl. She says, hi, Ashley, have you ever used acrylic glazing instead of glass when framing? I have been told not to use it for pastel because of static. Yeah, I've, heard, I've been told the same things, um, that it can actually draw the, draw the particles off of the paper due to static. So I haven't, I haven't, I've just used regular glass. I have, I have pastel drawings framed in regular glass, and it's yeah. nothing to worry about. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you guys and Matt, if you've seen the museum glass, it's pretty expensive. I've seen the museum glass. No, no glare. No glare. It's fantastic. Um, and I, I don't know exactly how it's manufactured or what the difference is with the museum quality glass versus the glass that typically comes with picture frames. Well, but, when um, I move to a museum, I'll yeah, get some of it's, that. It, it's great. I would love to get um, <laughs> artwork that I already have that's mounted or matted behind glass. I'd like I'd love to switch to the museum glass because then you can hang it anywhere. It doesn't matter if there's a light source, you know, directly behind you, the viewer, or directly in front of the artwork, because you're not going to get that glare. It's like it's not even there. It's real like real like glass should be. Like it's not even there. 
So talk to your local framers about that. I'm sure they'd love to order it for you and upcharge you. Because and charge a, you for yeah, it. Because yes. it's an expensive glass. Oh, you want the museum glass, huh? Hmm. Okay. Cheddar Rage, I see your question. I think it says, uh, why are so many artists alcoholics? I think you mean, why are so many people alcoholics? So, and and I I, I can't answer that. It's, it's, it's tough. It's a tough. Because people have addictive personalities. There you go. That's, and that's the answer. There are industries out there that feed off of people's addictions. Mm -hmm. One of them. And that's one of them. One of the many. Yeah. You don't, don't, guys, don't buy into stereotypes. No. Especially about artists, especially if you are an aspiring artist or are working artist or, um, you know, all that stuff is just a bunch of junk. Because yeah. I tell you, if anybody breaks any preconceived notions about artists, it's, it's Ashley and I. So it's probably true. Uh, don't and don't try to be something that's not not who you no, are. Art's bigger than that. There's not, it's not for a certain type of person, you know, for a person that's inclined towards their emotions or a person that's inclined towards the analytical art yeah. for all of these kinds of people. And there's a process and a medium for each, each, each personality type. And for Matt and I's personality type, it's all of the media. So whatever that means. It's typical, you know, for art teachers, we use them all. So, all right, let's see. We're all caught up on comments. <laughs> Barb says, I'm addicted to art supplies. Got, you got me there. Me too. I think I like art supplies more than the art sometimes. All right. So I'm going to finish this off. I know that the time is up, whatever that means. Oh, I didn't, I, that was lost on me, man. I'm yeah, wh whatever that, that means. Yeah. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I'm going to keep going here and I'm going to finish this off because I'm almost, I'm almost done, honestly. Let me go down here. And then I'm going to clean things up. And you can see I've, I've gone back in with a couple of pastel sticks to add a little bit more bolder color and more of a painterly feel. And I'm going to do that some more here in just a minute once we get this background quickly filled in. Now, obviously, if I had more time, I would go a lot slower with this background and refine the edges. Do you think about using like pan pastels with this kind of a background? Uh, you can, of course. You, you would use those first, though. And then yeah, the you, you would so typically use that first. Start, and then been a different, um, a little different. Process. Yeah, I just I don't use pan pastels that much. And they're. They're great, but a lot of the stuff you can do with pan pastels, you can do with just regular pastels, mm -hmm. too. Um, like, if I wanted to get all that strokiness out of there in this area, I, I, I can do that with, with pastels. Yeah, you can still work it down Yeah, so it's doesn't, super smooth. Yeah. Um, John reminds us of one of our favorite phrases. The timer is just a suggestion. That's right. Just a suggestion. And it's suggesting suggesting that I stop, but <laughs> I'm not stopping yet. And the background down here is actually more of a bluish gray, mm -hmm. dark bluish gray, but I'm getting some nice comments rolling in about your bird. Oh, thanks. Your work lo always looks better than the reference photo. This is oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah. You know, our, our medium gives us a chance to pump up the contrast or the color saturation. Sometimes that's nice and looks like Matt's done a little. Don't bit let me here. don't let me forget to show the show the bee, the bee too. Show the bee. That's when right. We're, we're, got a, we're not quite done. We're not quite done. We're gonna we're gonna show you the bee now. If you, once you see the size of the bee, if I were this bee eater, I would just fly away. Uh, yeah, def definitely. Big bee. The bee is big. That's what B shed. No, that didn't work. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, let's see here. Let's grab a little bit of this uh, light yellow, but a few 
Looser pat. Pastelli marks. Right along. Final, final right touches. Here. And sometimes the final touches are put back touches that we lost in the process. That's a nice little crisp mark up there. Makes it feel soft. To put a little bit of shadow underneath these talons. Well, Jen says it's a good looking bird. Hooten Holler says, great job, Matt. Loved Thank all you guys. the too. Let's see, where else can we put a little, little sparkle of color here? Bring this a little bit further. I haven't gone anywhere. I'm just getting another color. A bit of a light pink right here. Oh, yeah, right behind the eye. Uh, there's a little white spot there. That's good. Um, and, and still fits into our so, color scheme. Pink is red. Uh, Deanna suggests find the a, bit color of that white, I want. a bit of white on the branch, maybe. Well, we can make it a little bit brighter. I, I don't mm -hmm. know if I'm going to put white. But... Sometimes a color looks more lit than, uh, yeah. than just white, even though it is darker than white. Getting that color it's in a, there can it's sometimes a good feel suggestion. brighter. Yeah, yeah, good suggestion. That's working. I like that. Yeah. There's some nice fresh marks on there, too. Mm. Actually matches the um, intensity that you have in your bird. All right. I still want looking for a special color. Yeah, I want to hit that that orange up there at the top, but I just can't find the right. <sighs> oh, I found the right color. Color I wanted up there. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, you've used a red orange before, hadn't you? Yeah, but it wasn't this one. There, there we, we go. go. There we go. There we go. Searched high and low for that. All right. So I guess we'll call this finished. It's well, it's a I think it's a great looking beat. Yeah, it's all right for 45 nice. minutes. Um let's let's take the tape off. That's the fun part, right? Whoop. The tail of the tape. And this this uh paper, I'm so glad I wore white pants tonight. Um <laughs> <laughs> this uh paper the the tape pulls off very easily so i don't have to worry about tearing anything really still need to pull at a 90 degree angle if possible low and slow there all right go. always looks great to pull the tape off it's like we're looking out of a looking out of a window now i, to, I hate this little green lollipop over here <laughs> mm. I will. All right, I'm gonna have to stop. Okay, uh, so let's uh, well, let me get this out of the way, and I'll show you the the bee we're working on right now for the live lesson. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing with that is we're using Scratchboard. If you'd like to see that in process, and you're not a member, then you can sign up for a free seven day trial, and uh, and come watch Matt work on this here in the next hour after yeah. we leave getting sketchy. So this is what we're working on for the live lesson series. So uh, bee eater, bee, Whoa. <laughs> and uh, this is scratch board. So all the areas that you see that are, that are white are scratched out. This this is a hard board covered with ink, and then you use sharp tools to scratch out yeah. uh, the light areas. So you're basically uh, you're drawing the the light values, yeah. but you're removing the ink to reveal the light. It's values. a lot of fun. So yeah. All right. Let me put that over to the side. 
Yeah, that would be a that would be a deluxe meal for a bee eater for sure. Yeah, they put some stuff in the freezer. Yeah, yeah. keep keep yeah. parts of that. Save it for later. Keep, keep it that, for lunch. Keep tomorrow. parts of that bird for a while or that bee for a while. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go ahead and switch back over here if we're done with the comments. And I'm going to push the right button this time. All right, guys, I pushed the right button. I actually hit the, the transition practice button. Practice makes it perfect. Uh, yeah, practice makes perfect. Uh, I had to look at the button very closely in order to do that. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you drew alongside of me, I hope that you are happy with the results that you have. Um, and, you know, we do this in 45 minutes, but take your time with your own drawings. Uh, these are sketches. These are loose, quick drawings. And um, they're a good way to practice, too. You, you know, you're using the same muscles before anybody says there's no muscles in your brain. I know, but you're using the same muscles, <laughs> quotations, that uh, you use for a finished, more developed drawing it's true. and in just a shorter period of time. So if you get in the habit of practicing every day, drawing small objects, no matter what medium it is, it's going to improve your observation skills. And that is what drawing and painting is all about. It's all, all about observation and understanding what you see and being able to put that information on the surface. Uh, Ashley, you got anything else? That, I just wanted to piggyback on that. It's a great yeah. point. I had some teachers in college that um, wouldn't really let us in, in their classes uh, work on our artwork more than once. So um, if we were in a two-hour class, we would work on an artwork for two hours and never again. Or if it was a mm. four-hour class, we'd work for four hours on it and never again. Because they wanted us to go through that process that Matt's referring to as many times as possible before we mm -hmm. graduated, not just a few really big times. Now, yeah. I had other types of courses where we did work on artwork for a really extended period of time, like printmaking and some design courses. But in drawing one, two, three, and painting one, two, and three, it was one shot and go to the next one and solve another art making problem. So there is a lot to be said for making shorter duration artworks and just stacking up those artworks in your, uh, in sort of your um, uh, history of experience that you'll have to, to draw from, no pun intended, uh, in the future. Great yep. questions tonight. I love that you guys are asking some questions about. Um, artwork and art materials that that we're not doing here on getting sketchy because that means you guys are making your own art besides what we're doing you're you're exploring yeah. and blazing your own trail so keep bringing those questions to the show um that are, are more in line with whatever you're working on personally i love that even if we can't ask, answer them we love to hear them yep absolutely and i'm looking at my bird and i see that i made one of the tail feathers too long um that's the way it is um anyway yeah, what Ashley said about uh, the teachers not letting the students uh, continue the artwork, uh, that's very true. Because when you start a piece of artwork, you kind of get uh, your mind going in one direction. And you're making evaluations, especially in the early stages of a drawing or mm -hmm. painting. Um, and those really are the most important stages of the process. Um, and that's why, you're, that's why your brain might hurt right in the <laughs> beginning part of drawing or painting. Uh, but if you, the more you do that, the better you're going to get at it. The, the hurting of the brain, it, it's never going to go away. <laughs> it, it never goes away. Yeah. It, every drawing or painting that you create, no matter what your skill level, is a challenge. And um, you get better at executing those challenges, but it's always going to be a challenge no matter what your skill level. So if you're expecting that feeling to go away, it never goes away. Uh, but you're just going to get better at it over time. All right. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, we got to get ready real hustle. quick here uh, for the next uh, show. And hopefully we'll see some of you there. Um, for the rest of you, we'll see you right here next week. Uh, next Wednesday, Ashley will be doing the drawing. Right. And uh, either Monday or Tuesday, I'll have the photo up. Maybe Wednesday. We'll see. But uh, <laughs> I'll try to get to you next week. <laughs> uh, no, I'm talking about me getting the video up. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, Y'all have a great week. Uh, good night, everybody.